Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India continue with uh, from where we left on the earlier class on deep learning and uh, I would now be discussing about basically a bit of historical perspectives and what we call as a family of deep learners over here. Now for that uh, let us look into how deep learning came into its origin and how it was growing up. So now for that uh, the very simple term is that this is not something which just came up in the recent past it has been there for quite some time now. So we started with uh, around the age of 1950s when we had these neural networks come up with the initial days and that is when uh, they started with actually McCulloch and Pitts model. So somewhere around 1943 from there we came up with Hebbian rules in 1949 till supervised learning by Rosenblatt in 1958 and from there to auto associative memory in 1980 and uh, this auto associative memory concept is something which is uh, uh, much more rampant in use today and that is what plays down a role into how these neural networks can learn and also understand how to associate certain patterns and uh, with, with uh, what an outcome is or where it would be in terms of a deep neural network where it will be learning as to understand what an image for a particular class will look like. So it is going to associate these image appearances to class labels itself. Now in the 1960s was when uh, a lot of uh, neurosciences and biological neurosciences were uh, coming with uh, mathematical discoveries and uh, both the communities were benefiting each other from each other's work and that is where uh, a lot of work came down onto how feed forward within multilayer perceptron happens and can we use them in order to understand how in our own visual perceptions how we perceive objects. So do we do it like it is something like does our eye uh, look at everything as a camera sensor on a CCD sensor or a CMOS sensor as in a camera or does it actually have some sort of a uh, processing pipeline within the whole process. So does it sense instead of images of pixels is it sensing a array of uh, different directed edges and gradients and then is, it, is our brain reconstructing the way we look at the outer world together. So this was the work which went down around 1960s and from that till 1980s we had this new term called as neocognition and what that meant was a new sort of uh, uh, network started coming up which were called as convolutional operations networks. Now if you look at uh, the network which we were looking in the earlier class so we just were connecting all neurons to all neurons now instead of connecting every neuron to all the other neurons in the subsequent layer if we can define some sort of a convolutional operation. So say I have a weight vector which can translate in sort of a sliding window fashion. So now uh, on my first uh, input node if I have say something uh, uh, 441 such nodes and I want to connect it to my second hidden layer uh, to my first hidden layer which has about 400 nodes. Now instead of uh, how many connections I can draw down is basically 441 connections to each of these nodes. And similarly, so this will form down a matrix of 441 cross 400 which is the translation which goes down. Now say instead of that I take down a small set of vectors and this is called as a convolution kernel. So I have just a convolution kernel of size 5 and say I can convolve this and uh, pass it over the whole thing. So I will can define the output of my first input uh, nodes to the hidden layer in terms of a convolution. Now the number of weights I will have to look over here is actually much lesser because it is no more all the connected weights over there but the number of weights is basically 5 which is left down. So the number of computations go down and again the beauty of convolution which is making it uh, space invariant comes into over here. So in terms of understanding whether an uh, image has uh, say for, for our case if it is an image of a cell. So now whether the cell is present on the top left corner or the bottom right corner it is invariant to each of them because I will just be convolving with these kind of weights over the whole image I will be able to find out the features of the image wherever wherever the object be located 
over there. Now these were the new concepts which are coming down around in 1980s and from there came down another interesting concept called as max pooling which is to reduce the complexity of networks and from there we came down to another interesting concept called as back propagation which is about how can we uh, take the error back behind over there and do it. So this is what we were using in the first lecture on neural networks itself for training a neural network and coming down to what is the optimal weight combination. Now sleek from there to 1980s from 1980s to 2000 is when a lot of uh, research went into understanding simple low complexity problem solving with these kind of networks. So that led to the birth of recurrent neural networks, then uh, long learning feed forward neural networks, there was advanced gradient descent, sequential network constructions which is how they can be constructed one by one at a time and from there to a very famous thing called as an auto encoder and from there a back propagating CNN which was a very fundamental discovery and in fact the exercise we will do later on will have a back propagating CNN itself for solving the same kind of a problem. So sleek from there to 2000 and onwards and this is where we land up beyond the era of uh, deep neural uh, beyond the era of neural networks standard neural networks and into the era of what we called as deep learning and where it started was uh, with one of these kind of deep neural networks winning the NIPS 2003 challenge on feature selection and uh, Lekun's very famous model of the digit recognizer called as a LayNet and similar like what we are going to use later on for our problem as well. So from there to deep Boltzmann machines and autoencoders. So right from there around in 2006 onwards we saw a major boost in the way deep learning was being done. Because if you look over here, typically these networks have a lot of connections between them. So the number of multiplications, the number of nonlinear operations you are going to do is actually seriously large. It's not a very small number. So you need a good amount of computing power available at your space to do it. And say with a desktop computer, it would never be possible, finitely possible. You would actually either be needing a lot of RAM space and in any ways your process power is always limited to one single thread or maybe for um, certain machines which have hyper threading support on them you can have multiple threads up to four threads or eight threads or uh, in, in total. Now even with them the total time you would be taking is going to be finitely seriously large. Now with advent of these GPUs and what Nvidia got down in the recent past is they upgraded their gaming cards with cores present over there using specific library called as CUDAs where you can use all of these cores as compute cores for solving the purpose. So we have specific libraries called as CUDNN libraries these days which help you in creating a neural network on the gaming card itself. So you can just buy a simple gaming card for less than 10,000 Indian rupees and use that as a supercomputer attachment onto your desktop computer and train down networks much faster. So we will be doing uh, exercise later on in the day where I am going to use a similar gaming quality uh, graphics card as a GPU alternative and we are going to show basically how fast we can learn the whole network. So from there till 2009 we got down this deep uh, uh, belief network on the GPU which was a seminal contribution to max pooling and CNNs on the GPU which required a significant amount of efforts in terms of the uh, VLSI design constraints within how GPUs are designed. And in 2012 with ImageNet winning the ImageNet challenge uh, from uh, Alex Krivsky with the AlexNet is where uh, it actually made the whole community come down to a consensus that deep neural networks are what is going to rule down uh, at substantially the field for a longer period of time now and this is a uh, sort of a framework which can be used as very feasible solution to a lot of problems we were facing. So instead of each of us trying to work on a different area and uh, arguing across as to which is more important whether a feature extraction is more important or classification is more important or who is at a much more superior phase. The whole community now comes to a consensus that let's understand that it's a hierarchical problem, let's put the whole hierarchy into one single place and let's take one single model which can learn the hierarchy and solve the problem. And this is what we are going to speak. Now if you look into deep learning you basically have a family of learners over there. Now the first family is called as the fully connected network family and this is similar to a multi-layer perceptron. So what happens is that each neuron on any layer is connected to every single neuron on the subsequent layer of the hierarchy. So the first model is an autoencoder which learns to basically encode and decode. So uh, to put you in very simple terms it's basically you take an image patch 
you feed through this network at the output over there you should be able to reconstruct the same image patch so if i have a 5 cross 5 patch on which i see an apple on the output also i should be seeing the same apple coming down over there this sort of a network is called as an auto encoder it makes up of one part which is called as an encoder and another part which is a decoder and since it's encoding itself that's from where the name comes down so then we have a stuff called a stacked auto encoder and what does this is basically you stack down one by one auto encoders together and you create a much deeper network and that's where it gets its name next one is a sparse auto encoder where what you have is basically that uh, we had seen that particular problem in the last uh, class where we were trying to solve down pixel level uh, pixel level level labeling problems on the optical coherence tomography images in order to find out which pixel belongs to what kind of a tissue and uh, on the second uh, layer over there we could see that most of the values were zeros there were some values which were just ones or minus um, a very high negative value over there now this kind of a sparse auto encoder is what is going to help you in finding out imposing that kind of a sparsity constraint over there then there are denoising auto encoders which you can use as denoisers actually so if you want to remove noise from a certain kind of an image without you knowing that what is the distribution of the noise or what is the basis function of the noise you can actually learn them using a neural network and very easily remove and in fact you can remove those noise of very complex nature so there can be gaussian and a speckle noise there can be poisson and a multiplicative noise together coming down and you can denoise these kind of images by learning them appropriately from there is a convolutional auto encoder which is a uh, mold between convolutional neural networks and an auto encoder so basically each layer of the uh, auto encoder is a convolutional function itself so that does not typically qualify as a fully connected network but again since it comes from the family of an auto encoder we just uh, keep it over here for the same purpose from there the second one on fully connected networks are belief networks which consist of a uh, restricted boltzmann machine and deep belief network so a deep belief network is basically sort of a stacked version of the restricted boltzmann machine itself and um, as the name suggests a boltzmann so this is what uh, has a boltzmann distribution imposed over there and you can have very good amount of memory uh, associativity within these networks now you can read about details of them in much specialized literatures but for our stuff we will just keep them to the minimum the next family is a convolutional uh, neural network so in convolutional neural networks you can have generalized convnets or uh, very specific models which have come out in the recent past so some of them are called as lanets google nets and alex nets so lanet is again from that mnist challenge with uh, jan lekun was solving in 1998 and uh, so they have a much uh, improvised version on top of that from google and that's called as a google net and uh, the image net challenge being solved by alex krivsky is what's called as the alex net uh, then there are unets and rest nets which are basically uh, networks where you can put a whole image and get down the segmentation of the whole image instead of doing it as a pixel by pixel manner and every single layer over there is implemented as convolution functions from there we have recurrent neural networks and one very famous um, component of that is a uh, long short term memory which can try to encode temporal patterns itself within a network so if you're looking at uh, say temporal data which is uh, say there are scans of cancer patients every 6 months on of the same portion so if you want to relate between the temporal side of it the same voxel at the same space on the same patient but every 6 months and you want to do a follow up so you would be using some sort of a temporal mapping and that's where you would be making use of lstm like networks so let's uh, get into a few of these uh, places where uh, deep learning is playing a big role today for medical image analysis and that's what's the whole agenda of our discussion is so the first one i would like to uh, point out is this particular paper from pami in 2013 on uh, one of the special issues on deep learning and this was about organ detection in mri and a very clear case in which the idea was that uh, can each pixel over uh, an mr sequence so if you have one of the slices in say a t1 sequence or a t2 mr sequence then can i label each single pixel as to it belongs to which particular uh, kind of a tissue or which particular kind of an organ so there were manually annotated examples which they were using and the solution was not uh, a very uh, computationally complex solution so it was just a very simple uh, stacked auto encoder which was doing unsupervised feature learning and um, finally at the final stage it was uh, mapping them down onto which particular uh, organ it belongs to 
So, this is a very seminal contribution which came up and the way this whole learning was done without having to handcraft and hand engineer features was seriously wonderful uh, contribution at that point of time. There was a uh, uh, transactions, uh, IEEE transactions on medical imaging special issue which came out in May 2016, which speaks about all on deep neural networks. So, this was just a special issue which had all papers where deep neural networks were being used to solve medical image analysis problems in total. So, that ranged from microscopy to MR to brain to uh, uh, histologies to uh, robotic surgeries, everything over there. So, it is a good collection of papers which I would definitely add as a pointer for you to go through if you are trying to uh, make sense of where and how people have been using these kind of uh, techniques in medical image analysis itself. Now, first few snapshots from the issues are where uh, on brain tumor segmentation using convolutional neural networks, then on uh, using uh, deep 3D convolutional encoder networks with shortcuts for multi scale feature integration for multiple sclerosis detection and lesion segmentation in brain MRs and uh, then there is another one on automatic detection of cerebral micro bleeds from MR images using 3D convolutional neural networks. So, this is where uh, we are no more limited to images or 2D, but since the data is inherently 3D in the voxel space. So, we are going to use all of the voxel information and design a neural network which is also operating on the voxel space. So, earlier if we had a small patch of 5 cross 5, then I just have 25 pixels and my convolution operator may be another smaller one which is rotating operating only on the spatial scale. Over here, I will be having now instead of uh, uh, 2D scale, I will be having a 3D volume. So, I will have a 5 cross 5 cross 5 voxel space which is 125 voxels. So, now I can define a very small convolution operator say maybe 2 cross 2 cross 2 which is just 8 elements over there which can move in the voxel space and do convolutions over there. So, this is what brings in the beauty and some novel changes which the community itself had to do. If you look at computer vision community as such, that is not where we uh, operate on uh, 3D data day in and day out. It is majorly 2D data which has a time uh, access to it, but over here it is majorly 3D data. Although at some certain point of time when you are trying to do a dynamic MRI kind of stuff, you would also be getting a 4D data where it is 3D data over time. So, you have 4 dimensions. So, that is where you would bring down much more novel contributions as to how can these modeling be done maybe with 4D neural networks or something even beyond that and much more radical and interesting. Uh, so, from there I would uh, point out to one of the earlier work which we had presented sometime early in uh, 2016 and this was about uh, a concept called as distribution preserving auto encoder. Now, the beauty over here is when we were telling about these auto encoders and uh, the concept was that I wanted to always preserve the same patch. So, whichever go whatever goes in my input the same has to be created on my output and that is what I would like to look at it. But if you look at speckle images, then uh, you would not necessarily have a one to one mapping because speckles are necessarily uh, spatially non stationary. So, they, they do not remain stationary in space when you are taking it over multiple points of time. So, but however, the only thing which is constant for them is that the distribution they come down from the same sort of a distribution. So, what we wanted to do was can we create a network which can learn to encode in a way such that the output has the same distribution as the input. So, this is what we were doing with uh, distribution preserving auto encoders which paved a very great uh, way in uh, solving a challenge about plaque detection in optical coherence tomography images. So, we could very effectively delineate plaques and this is one of the 3D uh, visualization. So, we have this whole model running on a frame by frame basis over a whole pullback of cardiovascular optical coherence tomography images on which we find out these plaques and then how the whole 3D topography is mapped down over there. So, you can have a, uh, a careful look over there as well and this is a model which is pretty simple to implement does not take much of uh, compute time requirements during testing. Uh, uh, however, the cost functions and everything is definitely something where we had to put in lot of way in which how the data transfer happens and how the networks are gone. So, uh, what I wanted to basically say through these ones was that it is not necessary that you will have a one shot single go implementation where you can just take a model and do it. A lot of times you will have to innovate yourself you will have to create your own networks, own training function cost measures as we had done over here. So, instead of taking a mean squared error or sum of standard sum of squared errors over there, we thought of taking down a, a divergence measure so that we map down distributions between each of them. So, these are new 
innovations which come down when you are trying to use neural networks and specifically deep neural networks for the area of medical image analysis. Now with this we are almost at the end for uh, deep neural networks although it is a very interesting topic and uh, it would have been fun to devote many more hours onto this one which itself is a much more specialized topic but I am just over here to give you an introduction and some user case scenarios where they are working. So, uh, here when we come down to an end uh, I have this famous quote by Trishul Chilembi which and he says that uh, this deep learning thing is quite like quantum physics was at the beginning of the 20th century and uh, I, I just leave it up to you to figure out why does he say something like this and now the reason why he is saying it is because if you look at quantum physics that it was at the beginning of the 20th century then there were a lot of experimentalists and practitioners who were ahead of it and who were ahead of the theoretician. So, it took a lot of the time for theoretical physicists to say and explain each and every single stuff about quantum mechanics whereas uh, experimental physicists were observing it much faster. So, today with deep learning it is the same thing when we look into the theory of deep learning it is really complex to understand and uh, explain over there and without those explanations possibly it is really hard for you to even make a way through in terms of publication or even a single product development over there because until you are able to explain the theory there is no surety about why it is working the way it is working over there whereas uh, uh, in practice we do see a lot of things just work like magic and as a black box and this is a point where I would definitely leave a thought for you that just do not trust it as a black box try on innovating over there and please make a sense of understanding why your method is working the way it is supposed to be working or why it is not working the way it was supposed to be working which you had desired. Now that takes us to uh, the end of it and I just have a take home message over there. So uh, as far as working with deep learning and if you want to do some serious amount of work then you would possibly need a custom designed workstation which is uh, with a GPU and although I am going to demonstrate it with a very simple gaming grade card but uh, it is generally suggested that for most of our serious experiments we do use a GTX Titan X grade of card or a Tesla K40 and um, so there is an M40 which is also over here now and you have the P100 GPUs coming out or you can use a uh, uh, much more uh, affordable version of them on a GTX 1080 or a GTX 1060 as well. And uh, if you can really afford then DGX1 is a deep learning box a single box solution which is provided by NVIDIA and um, it is great for doing it. On the toolboxes side of it you can use Theano and PyLearn2 within Python for deep neural networks. Uh, uh, on a separate language called as Lua you can use the library called as Torch. Uh, for NVIDIA things you would be requiring CUDA, digits and CUDN and in fact like if you want to call down the GPU through any of these either from Python or Lua you will still be requiring CUDN and uh, CUDA. Uh, if you are not a much fan about these uh, large object oriented programming or complex languages you can still choose to stay with your uh, very homely comfortable environment of MATLAB. So, just uh, uh, GitHub for uh, the deep learning toolbox and you will be getting down a very sweet link coming down over there which you can use for learning deep learning. And, uh, in fact MATLAB 2016 onwards uh, within the neural network toolbox you also have auto encoders and CNNs uh, as a standard package and feature available. So, do feel free to visit them and make use of them and for reading more about deep learning there is a website where we have a ebook for deep learning available now. So, that is written by uh, the major players on the field you can visit deeplearning.net which is a major website where we socialize and all new postings in the field of deep learning come up. And beyond that I would suggest that you read this you can have a good read over this overview paper which is which provides most of the materials which we have been using for these lectures and you can also have a look through this particular book on uh, deep learning methods and applications. And for looking at conferences uh, ICLR and NIPS are the places where majority of stuff related to deep learning are published. So, with this I come to an end of the theory class and uh, we would have a small demonstration uh, with using with solving the same ALL problem on uh, using uh, uh, torch on Lua for our deep neural network implementation. So, uh, we get back to the practical demonstration of uh, using a deep neural network and we will be using an architecture called as the LANET in order to solve this problem. So, what we would be doing is we are again going to use the same ALL IDB images which we had downloaded in the last uh, example as well. So, that uh, I can explain you uh, the whole concept over here. 
Now on top of that uh, our deep learning purpose will be solved using uh, Torch which is a scientific computing framework which is based on Lua just in time uh, compiler environment. So uh, you can uh, like just go down to the website called as torch.ch and you would be ending up on this page. Uh, only uh, reservation over here is that this is available uh, for Linux based systems and Unix based systems it's, it's very easily combined. So you might need to have a Linux based system available over there. Now uh, they provide a very simple uh, step by step pause uh, if, if you want to install Torch on an OS X platform from Mac or on uh, Ubuntu uh, as well. So what you can do is you can follow down each of these instructions over here and just keep on doing. You would um, this would be downloading about uh, 2 gigs of uh, data through your network so you need to be at least available with that much of bandwidth from your side and once you are able to finish till this bash rc thing and uh, just as a word this would uh, take you some amount of time so typically this git clone and um, the recursive cloning over there and then the installation this takes you roughly uh, 30 minutes based on what kind of a bandwidth speed you are affording over there and then the whole installation completes. Now once you are over here uh, what you can do is after that uh, if your system has a GPU which I would strongly recommend uh, is how we are also going to do over here then you would need access to the NVIDIA CUDA toolkit in order to uh, use your GPU and make it faster. So uh, today the CUDA standard is CUDA 8 so you can just google down for NVIDIA CUDA toolkit or just go on developer.nvidia.com slash CUDA toolkit and you would be getting access to that. So uh, on the CUDA 8 toolkit you can just press on uh, download over here. Now this goes down to another page on which uh, it would ask you basically a few set of questions you can select your system say Linux and then uh, it would be asking you another set of question as to what is your processor architecture for most of us it would be an x86 or a 64 system so I click on this and uh, then it asks me another question as to what sort of OS I am using most likely we are going to use Ubuntu at least for my system it is that. I prefer using the 14.04 because of a lot of support issue issues around with other software pipelines as well. So I have this 14.04 and uh, I also prefer using the Debian uh, distribution file on a local one instead of a run file or any of them. So just click on this and you would be directed to a download link. So now you can download this 1.9 gigs over here and once the download is complete you can just do a dpkg and uh, load this one onto your apt-get repository and from apt-get now you can basically install CUDA. So this is also going to take you so apart from this 1.9 GB during the update process it would be taking about couple of uh, hundreds of MBs as well uh, on the download so mm, and then it takes about roughly uh, two hours of a time from getting torch till CUDA and everything downloaded. Now beyond that you can also install CUDNN if you would like to use CUDNN features as well. Now uh, that is uh, something uh, you can just google and find out for more of details as well. Now let us get down into the actual part of the stuff. So what we have done is we had our data set over here. You had seen these images over there. Now uh, all of these images uh, we have actually packed them onto some sort of files which are called as .t7 which is a standard extension for torch version 7. So we will be loading down um, our preformed data. So it, it's, it generally takes a longer amount of time to load each image at a time. So what we have done is we have transformed that into some sort of a matrix and stored that as a data file. I will just load one file and I get an array of all the matrices. So in torch we call it as a tensor. So we just have a 4D tensor in which uh, my first dimension is basically the num image number which I am going to get. The second dimension is each of these color planes. The third dimension is the rows and the fourth dimension is the columns. This is how Torch natively handles it out and how we pack down the data. So we will be providing you with uh, small MATLAB codes on uh, how to create these .t7 files as well and I am not discussing it any further now. Now from there let us move into our network over here. So uh, this is a standard code on Lua how it would be looking like. So uh, you have certain kind of files which you would be needing to call. So we are using a CUDNN library as well. So I'm calling down uh, NN which is for defining neural networks and then I do a require for CUDNN because I want accelerations on this CUDA and with the CUDNN library itself. 
and uh, GNU plot is for basically I want to plot those fancy epoch versus uh, error rates one. Now this is a place where uh, I am just loading out all the data. So I have my training set, I have a validation set and I have a test set. This training set is where uh, I take all the training data on which my errors would be computed and I would be doing the back propagation. I take a validation set in which what I would do is basically that is a set which is not used in the training but every epoch I push this set in order to find out what is my error and I can use that error in order to find out to a uh, closing point of where I need to stop training any further and test data set is what I would be using subsequently after that. Now from there uh, what I do is uh, I have my network defined in a separate file which is called as lenet.lua. So this is where my whole uh, network is defined. So what I have is spatial convolutions over there. So I have three channels which are my three color channels mapped onto six channels over there. So there are basically six uh, convolutional operators which I am going to define over here which takes in three dimensional input and does it and each of them is a 5 cross 5 operator. So I have a 5 cross 5 cross 3 sized convolution kernel and six of such kernels being defined over here. Then I do a non-linear transformation in terms of ReLU which is called as a rectified linear unit. So uh, the only difference it has is basically uh, if a input to the ReLU is negative below z 0 then it cl clamps it down to 0. If it is positive then it just keeps the same positive value passing. This is also another sort of a non-linearity. Then uh, we do a max pooling over there over a uh, 2 cross 2 cross 2 cross 2 which is which means that I do take a 2 cross 2 area and then I shift push it down into one area. So a 2 cross 2 basically 4 pixels whatever is the maximum value in this 2 cross 2 element this is what is stored into one single pixel or a region over there and then I make this one move by a factor of 2 cross 2 such that I have non overlapping uh, max poolings coming down. So on this output over there I will again do a uh, spatial convolution. So what this does is all the six channels because I had six channels output from here. So I will be doing a 5 cross 5 cross 6 sized kernel convolution and there are 16 of such kernels which I am going to learn over here. So similarly I do all of those operations of max pooling and everything and here finally what I have is since I have 16 layers over there and uh, this 5 cross 5 is again dependent on what was my initial size of the image and how it comes down. So what we find is basically there are 16 cross 5 cross 5 uh, such. So it is basically what comes down and the end over here is 16 such 5 cross 5 patches and I just want to uh, linearize all of those neurons into one single layer. Now after having done this through view I have a linear connector between this number of neurons 220. So I map them to 120 hidden layers over there through via ReLU and this is the fully connected no more convolutional operations over here and then from those uh, 120 to 84 and from there again to 2 and then I do a uh, uh, log of softmax as a nonlinear transformation over there and this is what defines my linear architecture totally. So this is what I load over here you can actually copy paste the whole code over here and define it and do it but we do it just to keep the training part separate and the model part separate and it helps us in much better bookkeeping. So now what I do is I convert this model to CUDNN and uh, typecast this as CUDA so that I have all the operations available as uh, CUDN module and on CUDA memory space as well. I define a criteria which is my loss and this is a negative log likelihood criteria which is my classification error how do I define it and uh, then what I do is I also need to evaluate this criteria on the GPU itself. So that is why I am going to typecast it as CUDA so that my parameter space exists on the GPU memory itself. Then uh, what I do is I set a learning rate over there which is uh, 10 power minus 2 and total number of epochs over which I am going to train. I am putting a very smaller value over here as 10. Now what I do is I uh, take my uh, data set and just look into how many samples are present over there. So use the size operator to look into how many samples. Then I define two local variables which are just um, training error and validation error and eventually what I do is over one to total number of epochs I am just going to iteratively process this one. So for the first epoch what it would do is initially it would take. Uh, since it has multiple number of images over there so it is going to take one image at a time and then compute and then reiterate this whole process the way which we are learning over there. So it takes in the data and then it does a feed forward through the whole thing and evaluates what is the error which is what happens uh, over here. So you do a forward of the model so 
you have certain weights over that you put in the data you are going to get down certain output now what you do is you take this output and you know what is the target so you can do a forward on the criteria and find out what is the amount of error which comes down over here now what you do is you zero down all the gradients which were earlier computed and then you do a back propagation through this part over there so what you do is you back propagate and find out what is the total derivative across the error and you also back propagate this one across the model cumulatively and then you update the parameters of the model using this particular learning rate over there now after this has been done you can find out what is your uh, total training error over there and this is where it keeps on accumulating and coming up next what we do is uh, we move a bit below and we find out what is the total amount of training error by just taking an average over the total number of training data over there on this side of it we are also going to find out what is my total error in validation as well so i use the validation state over there do a forward and in the same way and then find out but this is no more being used in our back propagate so i don't have an update mechanism over there now once that is done uh, i will be plotting this is a uh, small module for with gnu plot in order to plot the errors over there then over here i'm going to test it with unknown data so i'm just going to typecast them onto cuda and then just do a forward of the model now once i am able to do a forward of the model i am going to get down my predictions now note that uh, since it was a log soft max so i needed to get an exponentiation of the whole thing that's why i am doing an exponential over it so that i get in the range of 0 to 1 and once that whole thing is done now i am going to get down my predicted values and predicted class and this is what i am going to print over there so let's uh, jump into how we run it down so typically for running this kind of a uh, code you will be uh, so i have already rooted into the uh, folder where my codes are located and my data so this is where my code and my data is located in terms of these t7 files such that it can load it very easily so over there i will just write down a small command called as uh, th which is a uh, uh, function for calling down the torch compiler itself and then say that this is the file which the compiler has to execute now once i do that i can press and enter so that starts with executing you can see that it's loading the data and then uh it's able to process out all the epochs over there and on the validation side over there you can see that these are the predicted classes so the predicted classes so since we had put down some 10 samples over there in order to see how the predictions were so the first one got predicted properly the second one there was a error in prediction the third one was correct fourth one was correct fifth there is again an error sixth it is correct seventh it is correct eighth correct ninth uh, eighth there is, there is a error ninth is correct tenth is correct and eleventh is correct so so like so for 11 of these classes we could see all of them and this is a plot which i got from my gnu plot about the total validation now if you see that this curve is actually still falling down it hasn't yet saturated so maybe i can put it down for a longer number of epochs maybe 50 epochs or 100 or 1000 epochs at a uh, lot of time and then if it comes down to a much lower error because the total error over here is still at the range of 0.5 so we would typically uh, prefer this to be in somewhere in the range of 10 power of minus 2 and that's where Uh, we expect that a lot of these uh, predictions would be correct so you can just have a play around with these ones by increasing the epochs as well and till then thank you